let's start the panel conversation. Uh, we have all three panelists, uh, and I hope panelists will oblige me by keeping their cameras on. Uh, so let me let me start with uh, Sangmin Nam. Uh, in your views, what have been some of the uh, keys for converting the science? into policies and actions at the regional level in Northeast Asia. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work in that, uh, in that sphere. Uh, you have been overseeing the initiative called Northeast Asia Clean Air Partnership. Uh, and uh, you know, in that you have been working to strengthen the collaboration and address transboundary evolution. So can you please uh, share some of the experiences that you learned out of your very interesting piece of work in this part of the world? Mr. Nam. Thank you, uh, BK. So I prepared a, a few slides to help our audience uh, better understand the, the program that we are running in Northeast Asia. Wonderful, please. So do you see the slide? We can, yes, and we can hear you pretty well. Thank okay. you. So I am coordinating this Northeast Asia Clean Air Partnership, uh, which is, was created in 2018. So under this Northeast Asia Regional Program for Environmental Cooperation. Uh, so this uh, program, the aspect was created uh, in 1993. And then since then, it has facilitated the cooperation among here six Northeast Asian countries for 20 years. And air pollution is one of the area that uh, the aspect has worked on. But nevertheless, uh, the work on air pollution was completely focusing on coal fired power plant. So, but as the countries were more ready to expand the scope of cooperation, finally, uh, the government member state to create the, this NIACAP in uh, 2018. But in it, so when we were driving this process, we were really looking at this science-based and policy-oriented cooperation. As Charlotte mentioned, we clearly see the missing step between modeling and policy action, also the separate scientific community in multilateral processes. So, so our idea, especially this idea from the Secretariat, was how to connect the science and policy. But so far, we are not very successful. But meanwhile, also we look at that we have to change our strategy. Slide mode is not working. Uh, what's happening? Sorry, let me share it later. Just let me uh, speak without slide in the case. So first uh, point I wish to stress is, uh, and we see increasing uh, scientific assessment from country level, especially for China. And I hear, I prepared a slide that shows uh, the number of uh, uh, journal articles from Chinese uh, scholars uh, in international journals. So now the issue is uh, whether multilateral mechanism like NIACAP should spend its own resources to invest in facilitating scientific assessment, or we mobilize the accumulated knowledge from country level to connect the result of a scientific assessment at the country level with a regional mechanism, regional programs. So rather than focusing, rather than trying to mobilize our own program on scientific assessment. So we try to utilize uh, country level assessment uh, for regional mechanisms. So this, in this regard, we created a science policy committee. And as Charlotte mentioned, uh, this multi-stakeholder collaboration. So we are also promoting the idea of a track two uh, processes. So one track, track one would be NIACAP's own work on mapping our policies and uh, developing joint programs on policy and technology cooperation. But second track would be uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration, engaging scientific community for them to bring their knowledge into multilateral processes. 
And then also during this process, uh, we have seen uh, increasing role of a public opinion, especially since 2013, uh, which WHO announced uh, uh, identified the uh, PM as a uh, major one of the top uh, cause of uh, uh, cancer. So since then, there is a rapid change in public opinion, and we could utilize, uh, I mean, we, we were able to utilize the public opinion to mobilize government. So more, more positive processes towards uh, regional mechanisms, especially now with a mobile phone, it's a public access to air pollution, air quality information. It really helped us uh, uh, influence government's attitude towards creating multilateral programs. And then the last point uh, is uh, now the 2020, uh, two years ago, Korean government launched the first uh, geostational satellite exclusively for air quality monitoring. So it is the first uh, geostational and satellite for monitoring air pollution. And it is covering from Japan to India. So, so the data from this satellite will be available for most Asian, most Asian countries. And it is monitoring air quality uh, about eight to 10 times per day. So unlike a low orbiting uh, satellite, so it has a more high quality uh, air quality data. So ESCAP is currently working with uh, Asian countries uh, from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia. Um, Pan-Asia Geospatial uh, Air Quality Information Partnership. So this uh, just uh, started uh, from last year, but because of COVID, we were not able to organize uh, meetings uh, yet. But nevertheless, uh, we will be able to provide uh, real-time data from this satellite uh, to most uh, Asian countries uh, through this, uh, uh, we call PAPGAPI, new partnership. Uh, because of time, let me stop here. And then I will share a slide uh, uh, with the organizer and then the organizer can circulate to participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nam, for sharing your, your knowledge and your work on this one. Uh, now let me, uh, let me request uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Puji uh, uh, on sharing her experience on uh, how uh, si how can we convert you know science into policies and and into actions, more specifically at the city and the national level, specifically uh, drawing on your experience of working in Indonesia. Dr. Lestari, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Fike. Well, I I don't ha have a slide with me. Or I didn't prepare a slide, but I will uh, inform about our experience. And since my uh, my my expertise is on air quality, and so I'm working mostly on air air quality project. And uh, the key of the uh, the key of converting the science to policy. Uh, for me, for us, for our experience is the communication. I think uh, I think it's very important to have a communication between the science, the academician, and also researcher with the uh, government or the policymaker. So this building the relationship is very, very important. And then also uh, beside that, what we done is actually we've been involved in many, uh, many uh, policy issue is in, in Indonesia, not only the city, but it's also the government. Also uh, involved in the policy reform since many, many years ago. So uh, the other one is that we also could write some summary and then short summary in the uh, uh, language that can be understand for everyone. It's not only science. And then we also could uh, could, uh, I mean, I mean, could publish in the media. So that's also the other, the other thing that we can do. Actually, in many, many years ago on, on Indonesia, when we also conducted a policy reform on the leaded gasoline in 2006 or 2007. So we conducted a lot of research on the blood lead level test in school children's. And then uh, our result was also published 
informed to the government, but it's on, not only to the policymakers, but it's also the impact to health is very important uh, uh, to be presented to the government because usually the policymaker or the government, it's, they are aware if they see the impact, the negative impact to environment, the negative, the negative impact to health, that will be the very, very important. So by uh, we are doing that and publishing also in many uh, medias, as I said, also we successfully actually done uh, helping to have the policy reform on, on like blood lead level test. And also, uh, I mean, uh, lead in, in the gasoline has been reduced in 2008 after, after that. But it's also uh, the interaction between the uh, the uh, scientists and the academician and also the government, it's very important. And when you're designing the research or you're designing the uh, research that might lead to the policy recommendations, it is also better that we involve the government in the beginning. So it's from the beginning, at least we inform them that we are going to have this kind of research, this kind of project that will be uh, need the input in the beginning so that after in the end uh, we actually can provide some uh, policy recommendation presented to them so they aware that there is a, a work there is a study there is a scientific uh, data or scientific result that can be adopted to be the policy implementation or recommendation for example when in 2016 when we are working with a project on Toyota Clean Air Project, PCAP in Jakarta on the emission inventory. So in the beginning, we also come to the government of Jakarta and we discuss about the, our project, our research, our ongoing work in Jakarta that also, uh, uh, they also, I think they're very happy to be involved, to be informed about this work or about the project. And then uh, after we completed our work, Actually, we come back to them with our project results, with our reports and inform them and then uh, the policy recommendation and what is the option control, possible control option that they can be applied with multiple uh, benefits. Of course, as just mentioned by Eric and Charlotte that there's a uh, co-benefits in, uh, in this project and they can be adopted by the uh, policy makers. And the other one is that, uh, as Charlotte mentioned, actually, that most of the institution, Charlotte mentioned, or also the government, they're working on single issue or focus on a single impact. For example, in, in Indonesia, it's one uh, in, in the same like Ministry of Environment and Health, there, there is a directorate of air quality. So they focus on the on air quality, how they tackle of air pollution. But the other one, there is only a focus on the climate. The other uh, department focus only on health. And they should know that there is a, a related or link between the air quality, climate, and health. So I think it's also in this case, it is better to uh, raise the awareness to the policymaker on this uh, interrelationship between among this uh, this issue like air pollution, climate and health and providing the understanding that one shot can have more multiple impact or multiple benefits. So they have to coordinate each other on uh, inter-institution, uh, inter-department so that they could have uh, working together or coordination. So I think that's uh, basically, but. The most important what we are doing is always uh, inform the government if we think that the, our result can uh, lead to the policy recommendation that can be implemented in the city or in the in the uh, government central government. Then we have to inform them. In Jakarta, I have many times actually inform the public, the, the NCO, working with NCO. NCO is also very important in developing countries in Indonesia to help and enforce also that, that we have some research that may be very beneficial. So we have uh, usually also engaged with the NCO and then uh, uh, 
provide the information to the government, local government, like as we done it for Jakarta. So we come to the uh, deputy of environment, uh, deputy governor in, in, in environment. So uh, uh, we, we present our work and then we also have a national workshop informing our research, our uh, finding in uh, which can be actually converted into the, the policy, can be adopted to be uh, a policy recommendation. So that's basically what we are doing in, in Indonesia. So that's uh, uh, make the government aware, make the government or the policy maker aware that we are here we are uh, have uh, we have our uh, research we have scientific that can support the uh, government in developing the uh, policy or the regulation but also the other way in indonesia is also very common that the government sometimes inviting us to help them so that's uh -huh. the very much easier actually because they invited us and they they're going to develop some of the uh, uh, emission standard, for example, or air quality standard. They invited us to be uh, uh, involved, to involve in this and to uh, uh, conduct the research or conduct the study. And then, the, then, then there'll be no problem actually. In this case, it's very, very much uh, here mm -hmm. because from the beginning, we get them involved in, in the uh, research. So that's basically from my experience. So if you have any a comment or question, I could uh, very welcome to, to answer or clarify in this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhi, for sharing your experience from Indonesia. Uh, this is really uh, very enlightening for the, for the participants, and I'm quite sure some of them can draw lessons, and some of these things could be replicated in other countries as well. So uh, this would be very interesting. And uh, of course, I, I myself have a couple of questions which I would like to ask. But for now, uh, let me move on to Dr. Dhanalakshmi Shivani, uh, who has been able to join us via phone. Uh, Dr. Shivani, very warm welcome to the, to the webinar. I know you have been doing some fantastic work uh, on the environmental and social issues at the local community level. So may, may I please draw on your experience uh, in sharing uh, what are, what do you think are some of the key issues or key features that could be utilized for converting science into policies and actions at the local community level? Uh, would you like to draw upon your experience out of India? Dr. Sivani, over to you, please. Thank you all for inviting me to this webinar. My deep appreciation goes to the organizers also. As we have already recognized that each country faces their own specific challenges to achieve global goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And India also going through big challenges along with pandemic situations. Air pollution is one of the severe complications of urban and rural India currently confronting with. One of the recent national sample survey data indicates that 77 percentage of the Indian population uses solid fuels like firewood, rope residue, cow dung cake, coal, lignite, and charcoal for cooking. Kerala is the Indian state stands in top rank of Nidhi Ayog's SDG index in SDG India index 2020-21 for the third time. But in my personal experiences from rural and peri-urban areas of Kerala, they are going with solid fuels for cooking as a primary or secondary option. There are many reasons for the use of solid fuel by LPG users that includes economic, social, and behavioral reasons. I have noticed the the lessons from my neighbors that this behavior attitude, uh, attitude is very prominent and it is impossible to eradicate that the use of solid fuel from their kitchen to a clean energy cooking stoves. Many of them spending much of money on buying these wooden logs from 
furniture manufacturers or rather available sources <laughs> but they don't know or are aware of that these activities exacerbate climate change and their own health issues even the educated family are, families are also justifying these activities and believes believe that the air pollution is only because of the vehicles on the road according to them solid fuel cooking is age old practices and it does not cause any pollution to our atmosphere as a some most of the population forget that we have to live with uh, in only one planet here we have national and state based policies regulations are available to combat climate change and ecosystem degradation so also to air pollution technological solutions and innovations based on scientific advancement is to some extent effective but most often these science policy interfaces do not address the human behavior which is a key factor to build up more conscious societies for achieving a carbon neutral lifestyle to attain net zero emissions as i have to conclude i am strongly believing that we are information of our harmful actions on our planet to our children does not give a proper guidance for them to allow them to follow a sustainable lifestyle but we we have to uh, dedicate we have to manage the educators and society members ardently need to create a generations for whom sustainable behavior is a part of their existence and identity this requires holistic approach to sustainable life both within the education system and within the government policy for internal land external air pollution thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr sivani for sharing your your experience out of india and some of the lessons that you have drawn very useful for all of us here in this webinar uh i'm being told that it is time for us to kind of uh, get into a, a wrap for this webinar so therefore i I'll, i'll draw a few uh, references of what we have accomplished in these last four webinars uh so first of all uh, on behalf of the the organizers uh unepdtu uh, i just and the asian development bank i would like to uh thank all of you participants in your continued interest uh in this very interesting topic uh and that has made this journey very very uh, enjoyable for our, all of us organizers uh we as you know we organize a series of four uh, four webinars and today is the last one uh, and in these uh, four webinars that were focused on uh assessing the climate and sustainable development impacts of projects and policies we have been able to cover a lot of topics some thought provoking topics and some of the knowledge sharing issues uh on the first one as you know we talked about tools to assess the sustainable development impacts of climate change of development projects and we we looked at different tools something like cdmsd tool uh we also uh, saw the the experience from indonesia especially on assessing the the uh, sd impacts of the joint creating mechanism projects uh we also learned about the adb's experience on the future carbon fund looking at the co benefits being delivered by the mitigation projects the second webinar that we did we we focused on the case of air pollution uh we are some of our international development partners like clean air asia the the international institute for applied systems analysis and the kyushu university they shared their experiences in using uh, co benefit tools for countries cities and uh projects individual projects in 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 the in asia uh we also uh, got to draw from the experience of ricardo energy and environment uh that reflected on how co, -ben co benefit tools can contribute to the discussion on the mrv the monitoring reporting and verification systems and more importantly the transparency framework under the the paris agreement and the last webinar uh, the third one that we did on assessing uh, and reporting uh, as the benefits 
we we learned about adv's new tool to assess and report the the sd impacts we also learned about the gold standards uh, sd impact assessment tool, uh, tool and how these tools can draw linkages between sd impacts and the uh, and the sdgs uh, so we we do hope that these tools can be utilized by various stakeholders including the policymakers in making an assessment of the projects and their uh, their contribution to the sd sdgs and today as you know we talked about the the air climate health nexus uh, which is a very thought provoking provoking topic and i think this needs to be discussed in greater detail uh, so uh, uh, together with other co-organizers co of this webinar series i do hope that uh, these topics that we have been able to cover over these four uh, webinars would have helped you to understand the methodologies and tools that are available out there uh, for assessing the sustainable development impacts on of various climate actions. Uh, so uh, moving forward, it is, uh, you know, uh, it is my sincere hope that uh, the, 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 the information, the knowledge uh, or the experiences learning from the various uh, experts on this series of webinars would have helped the policymakers, the practitioners, and other stakeholders to ensure that the investments in climate actions uh, would also uh, deliver substantial sustainable development impacts that are relevant as well as very important in the local context. I'll underscore the local context. So with this, uh, I would like to thank everyone, uh, all the participants, all the technical experts, and most of all, uh, our partners at UNEP DTU, as well as I just in organized this series of webinar. I'm really very impressed uh, personally that the, the people who have been attending this series of webinars have stayed on from the first to the, to the fourth one that shows uh, your keen interest in the topic and you have found these webinars to be useful. I, I personally think that by, by conducting these the series of webinars, we have been able to, to develop a community of practitioners who are keen on this topic and believe in this topic. So it's something that we would like to build on. So uh, please stay tuned. We will revert back to you and how we would like to continue this conversation, continue this dialogue and learning from each other uh, forward. Uh, so, but for now, it is it is my duty, my, my honor and privilege to thank you once again and bring this webinar series to a conclusion. Thank you so much. Stay healthy. Thank you.